This is our project for fantastical functional mugs. During this project, we're going to use the slab technique to create a mug that will hold liquid. We're going to create a stable and balanced freestanding piece of art. And we're going to use the elements and principles of art to create a unique and creative design. During this project, I'm going to produce a slab mug. So of course, I'm going to start out by rolling out some slabs. I'm going to use a lot of texture on this project to make it sort of fantastical in its textural qualities. In art, when we talk about texture, we can talk about actual texture, which is the way a surface feels, or we can talk about visual texture, the way a surface looks like it should feel. With ceramics, we can look at texture both ways because every surface can be felt. However, not every surface will feel like it looks like it should feel. Now you can see here that I'm rolling out an extra long slab. I'm using two boards because I need a slab that's going to be longer than just one of the boards if I'm going to go all the way around a four inch base that I'm going to make. Each of the boards is one foot square and to get around a four inch base I'm going to need about 13 inches. You can see that the boards don't like to stay together on this smooth surface, but it's easier to roll it on these wooden boards than it is to do it on the lab table underneath because it often sticks to the lab table. If I'm just patient and gentle with my rolling, I can make sure that the boards stay together enough to get a nice clean slab. In this case, a little bit over 13 inches because I want to make sure that I have extra to cut off. I'm also going to make a little trip to visit my texture library. Here I have a doily and I'm going to impress this into one side of the slab. It's easiest when something is a slab to impress a texture in it. It's a lot more difficult if you've already made it into a mug. Now you will see that I use those measuring sticks and a ruler and I'm going to cut off a squared off long rectangular slab. The first thing I do is I make one straight line along the bottom edge and now I'm going to measure with a ruler to make sure that the top edge is equidistant at both ends. So I make a little mark the same distance from that bottom edge and now the top edge is squared with the bottom. And then I'm going to make sure that I have a long enough section, at least 13 inches, maybe a little bit more, so that I have a nice long slab that I can use to wrap around my base. Notice that I made sure that the center of my doily was in the center of the slab. This now is a second slab that I had previously cut with the same doily and I'm going to use it as the base on the inside of my mug. I'm looking at the back of this longer slab and I'm thinking as fickle as I'm being on this project I might as well put another texture on the back of that. So I use the same measuring sticks and another doily and I press that into the surface. It makes the slab a little bit longer. I'm just going side to side and it will give me a nice texture. And I'm going to use this on the outside of my mug instead of the last one. The other one will be the texture for the inside of the mug. Now that I have my two main pieces, the edge of the mug and the base, I'm going to score and slip them together. And I need to decide whether I want to set the sides of the mug on top of the base or around it. And I'm going to set it around the bottom. It just sort of makes it easier on me, I think and you can see that I'm scoring the edge of the base all the way around. Cannot stress how important scoring and slipping properly is to this type of project. And you can see that I keep my slip in this case in a little condiment dispenser. I often keep slip nearby in a cup as well. It's just sort of when the mood strikes me this sometimes seems like an easier way to apply it. It's not necessarily any easier. Sometimes it's a little bit neater, that's all. Next, I'm going to size just how much I need to cut off the edges to make it fit nicely around. And then I'm going to score and slip the edges together along with the bottom, making sure that I don't see any daylight through any cracks. The proper way to score and slip is to rough up the edge very well. That's the scoring. And then the slip should go in very liberally. So get it into all of the score marks, make sure there's no air bubbles inside the scores, and then put it together and make sure it squishes out the sides. If it squishes out the sides, you can clean it up. But if it doesn't squish out the sides, you don't know that there is a good bond. You can see from this that I've made a cylinder out of clay using slabs. And there's a little bit of a rough edge on the side I'm going to work through. Once I make sure that it's not stuck to my palette, I come over here and I'm going to check and see if I can smooth this out. It looks like there's a little bit of it missing. 
So I'm going to take this brush, I'm going to clean it all up, uh, then I'm going to put a little bit of extra slip on it and add just a little piece of clay to the corner there. All I need is a little tiny coil and I'm going to fit something in there to make sure that it has a nice edge at the top and I'm going to score and slip that in place as well and then blend it all together. If I don't score it and slip it in place, the blending might not hold. So I really want to get it sort of gooey and nice and neat on the top. There we go. Now I'm just checking to see how level it is. And I notice one more little chip out of the edge. I'm going to fill that in the same way. Get it nice and gooey. And then I'm going to score and slip it and just blend it into the edge like that. And trim it up. And with all of this slipping, I'm noticing that the board is getting a little bit wet, so I'm going to trade it out for another one. So here's the cylinder barrel of my mug, and you can see that it has texture inside and outside all the way around. Now that I have that cylinder, I'm going to pull a handle for the mug in the traditional manner. I use a large bucket of water, and I lubricate the hand over and over again. I have wedged this clay first and then I sort of wedged it into a carrot shape with a large end that I use to hold on to and I keep lubricating my hand over and over again and gently gently pulling down and shaping the handle as I go over and over again you have to be patient this video is actually sped up it takes me twice as much time as you see here by changing the angle of my hand I can put a little bit more pressure on one side or the other and as you can see by flattening my thumb along one side I can get it more rectangular rather than circular and I get a little bit more oval by rotating my hand as well. All of the clay on the inside of this should be fully wedged so it's a very strong handle when it's done. Here I'm going to jump a few minutes ahead so that you can see cutting the handle off at an angle. You can cut it straight across. I usually cut at an angle because straight cuts tend to droop a bit on the mug and I don't want it to droop down too much. So by cutting it at an angle and then putting that downward angle on the side of the mug, I can give it a little bit of an upward thrust to sort of counteract the natural occurrence of gravity. Now that I've cut the handle off, I'm going to bring the mug over and I'm going to put it on the side that has the least amount of texture that was sort of the back side of the doily and I'm going to score and slip it into place needs a lot of scoring and slipping see I've got a slight upward angle so it's going to make it come almost straight off the side once gravity takes hold and I'm going to score into this quite a bit and then I'm going to get some slip in there making sure that it's nice and gooey and I'm going to stick the two together and hold them together for a little while so that they can set just a bit. And once again, I'm going to jump a little bit farther ahead. You can see me scoring and slipping the bottom of the handle as well onto the bottom of the mug. Going back and forth, just making sure that those are going to hold up and I'm going to need to let them set for a little while. And while I let them set, I've got some other things I can do. Since my fantastical mug seems to be mostly about textures, I'm going to make some other slabs about the same thickness that I've already made these, which is one eighth of an inch, and I'm going to put some interesting textures on them. So here I am using the guide sticks to roll out a thin slab, and now this is a texture plate. It was originally marketed to put textures on paper by rubbing pencils across it, but I'm going to use it to put this star texture on the slab. And Now I have some cookie cutters. These happen to be in the shapes of butterflies. In art, shape tends to be a two-dimensional concept. These shapes have a little bit of thickness, which technically makes them form, but since I'm only putting the texture on one side, and only one side is really meant to be seen, we're going to treat them as shapes. Now, if I was using new clay, it would have stuck to the texture plate, and it would be very difficult to get them out of the cookie cutter without destroying the butterfly. So I use a little bit older, stiffer clay, and it allows me quite a bit of leeway. When I'm rolling out a slab, it tends to make the slab a little crumbly on the edges, but the middle is nice and solid. Now I'm going to look for interesting places to put these butterfly shapes on my mug, and I'm going to score and slip them in place as well as I can. 
this on the handle, the wings are going to be upturned a little bit. However, I need to score and slip any place it touches something else really well. If I can remain very gentle with the upturned wing shapes and get them through both the bisque and the glaze fire, they should be fairly solid. You may also notice that the handle is attached to the mug here and it's had a bit of time to set so it's fairly solid. Each of the butterfly shapes is scored and slipped onto the mug right over top of the textures that are already there. You'll also notice that I'm going to decide to turn this mug into a ewer by putting a pour spout on the side opposite the handle. To do that all I do is a little bit of bending. So I could drink out of it but really it's large enough I figured I could pour something out of it very nicely. I did that before I put on some of the remaining butterflies because those butterflies might have to follow the contours of the ewer and I didn't want to have to bend them back and forth. Once I get them all on there I'm going to double check them to make sure that they're holding together, that all of the points that they're contacting the, the ewer at this point are in fact scored and slipped. If there's a little bit of overlap someplace it gives it a little bit more support like that butterfly right there. The tip of its wing is just one more point of contact that can be structural. With the butterflies all attached, I'm just sort of cleaning it up along the top edge. I've got some slip on a brush and it's going to smooth things out and try to keep it smooth until I'm finished. After looking over the butterfly ewer, I decided that there's a lot more that I could put on there. There's some pretty empty spaces even though they are covered with texture. So I'm going to roll out another slab and I'm going to use another texture and another shape. I happen to have a texture that's butterflies and just like I put stars on the butterflies I'm going to put butterflies on these stars taking a moment to line the stars up with the butterfly texture underneath so I can get a butterfly on each star if I can find a, a good place on the slab to pick one up. Once I have several of these stars cut out I will start scoring and slipping them onto the ewer like I did with the butterflies finding interesting places to put them over top of the handle and the textures that are already there. Even though the outside of my ewer has a texture on it that's a lot like scoring, I'm still going to score into that texture and the back of this star and I'm going to attach it with scoring and slipping like I would in any other time. I'm taking no shortcuts and keeping these pieces together. Eventually I will have all the stars attached to the outside of this ewer and then I will go back and check them and check the butterflies as well to make sure that they are nicely in place. I'm going to switch from this unfinished piece to showing you the bisque wear. You can see that I was not content with just butterflies and stars. I also put some hearts on the outside. It may be difficult to see at this angle, but there's also a coil that I ran around the bottom of the ewer to give it a foot to sit on. And there's texture inside as you can see. Here you can see that I've glazed it all over with a burgundy that I made specifically to show off the texture. So here let's check off our criteria. My mug is balanced. It's freestanding. It doesn't tip over. It has a body to hold liquid. It has a handle. It has a foot which is a coil on the bottom. I have altered the surface in both shape and texture and put shapes across the surface as well. With all that I've done to it, I like to think that this is a creative design. It's a minimum of four inches tall and wide. And I put a texture on the inside just to keep the interest up a bit. In this exercise, the term mug has been used loosely for what we would normally call a vessel, something that can hold liquid. How is yours different from others? Do you use a lot of textures or different shapes or forms to create the illusion that your mug is something else? Could it be a teapot? Could you pour from it? Can you water flowers? What is the use of your object of art? Also remember that your vessel has both an inside and an outside. All of these can be decorated or changed in some way to create an overall feeling to your work of art. What makes your art unique from all others?